Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's main event. <laughs> Let's get ready to rumble! In this corner, weighing in at a very unimpressive 95 pounds and possessing almost no fighting skill whatsoever, he lacks life experience and is in the midst of his most crucial developmental years. David, the average middle schooler! And in this corner, weighing in with the greatest resources the world has ever known, trained in literally everything. Governments fear him and people adore him. Goliath, the internet tech monster! <laughs> Fighters, are you ready? David, put down the screen. <laughs> Stop giving him weeks of standardized tests. He's about to fight for his life. Someone tie a shoe. <laughs> David, stop crying. <laughs> David, get ready. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to call the fight. This is a mismatch. Goliath, go to your corner. Stop the fight. <laughs> Do you get it? <laughs> Every day an underpaid, under-resourced, overstressed teacher is training your David. Every day this fight is taking place in classrooms across the country. The bell has rung and almost all our Davids are getting their asses kicked. I'm not against technology, it's an outstanding tool for education. But students are getting stuck by the screen, not reaching the space beyond screens. There are some points you need to know if your David is going to survive. David was a student of mine and he was a screen addict. He was out of control and out of touch. He had been given a screen to pacify him. His attention would flicker away just like the screen he was raised on. He was getting lost in his class of 30 because I couldn't pull him from his screen. Some teachers allowed phones, some didn't. Worse, his primary educator, his parents, his parent was clueless about his battle. But hey, at least he was quiet. The tsunami of screens hit our school and we weren't prepared. Goliath was on the attack and students were being overwhelmed. After teaching in public school for a decade, I could see where these stats were going. I felt like a lone voice of sanity as sheep were being marched off to the slaughterhouse. I woke up to look at the dystopia I was living in. I didn't know enough about how screens affect young minds. I did know and observe something was wrong. He had mentioned to another student, casually mentioned to another student how he was playing hours of video games. He was coming to class anxious. He would get restless. He was exhausted. I didn't know what I could do. As his corner man, I could only faintly scream, stop the fight. During my last year in public education, I came across David unconscious in the hallway. He was being resuscitated due to the medication he was on. He was on meds because of the screens. His parents' voice echoed in my mind. Hey, at least he's quiet. I had the guilt of a corner man whose fighter was down for the count. One. Two, three. I could have easily been like David myself. I was always being raised by a single parent. They would come home late. I was vulnerable to Goliath. But I was lucky, I had a brother. He was my corner man. He would take my siblings and I to run laps at a nearby park. He would teach us, he would take us for motorcycle rides. We would take his, his raft to Sloan's Lake in the middle of Denver and pretend to be on mission. He would teach us ninja skills in the parks, and we'd have neighborhood boxing matches. The guy was extroverted, and in my eyes, life itself. 
He was Tom Sawyer and Bruce Lee all at once. <laughs> the perfect big brother. I wouldn't appreciate how perfect till years later. What I've observed is that we need to balance students' introversion and extroversion, and that makes all the difference for student success. Introversion is looking inward, extroversion is looking outward. You see introverted, er, introversion in, in students who, in stressed out students who are more concerned about grades than understanding things, more concerned about class ranking. My brother was my corner man, helping me get the space beyond screens. Schools should emphasize extroversion. By extroversion, I mean being able to look outward, interested in the environment. With extroversion, you'll see, student, you'll see students awakening and expanding into that space beyond screens. A corner man needs to, to know his fighter's vulnerabilities. Use extroversion to protect your Goliath. Sorry, to protect your David. <laughs> um, a simple scientific, a simple scientific observation can lead to a huge change. I'll give you an example. In 1850, Dr. Semmelweis made a scientific discovery. He saw that washing hands before delivering babies was key to decreasing infant mortality rates. It seems barbaric that a doctor wouldn't wash his hands before delivering babies, right? Seeing students constantly introverted in their education is like watching old-time medicine, barbaric. An example would be taking away recess, canceling art, or enforcing rigorous grading. Here's another simple observation. Balancing introversion with extroversion is necessary to student success. This is easy to apply, this balancing introversion and extroversion. When we apply a principle, we get technology. Technology is not just computers. Technology is applying scientific knowledge to practical purposes. David had a technology. He had his sling. Well, this is our sling against this modern Goliath. Extroversion. Working with students to get them extroverted, to get them working beyond their screens, is not just an ideal, but a natural law or first principle. An engineer like Elon Musk takes a first principle and applies it. They use it. They build things with certainty. As I've come to understand more and more of these first principles, I've been able to develop more technology, education technology. You see, the screens in front of our students are mesmerizing. And that's the perfect word, mesmerize. The definition of mesmerize is to hold someone's attention to the exclusion of all else. Franz Mesmer was a German doctor who hypnotized people. Bluntly, that's what he was doing. This mesmerizing effect that screens create is a detriment to our students. It's holding their attention to the exclusion of all else. I'm a teacher, so I have to give you some more background on this. Thousands of years ago, someone observed a pinhole going into a dark cave. Magically, an image appeared of whatever or whomever was outside. Some of the first screens date back to 500 BC. Fast forward to the 17th century, and people are using the magic lantern for phantasmagoria. Phantasmagoria was a form of horror theater where operators would scare unknowing public with various images of death and the devil. Now, what you don't see behind modern screens is hypnosis, Pavlov, psychology, algorithms, exponential profits with minimal effort, and AI to ring out even more nickels and dimes. Once upon a time, screens were only gazed upon at a theater house. Gradually, they became more available and in more places. Then it was the latest blockbuster that everyone had to see. Households began acquiring a TV, then a TV in every room. You may remember this scene from Back to the Future. It was 1955, and the family was talking about its first television set. 
Marty was from 1985 and mentioned he had two televisions. They didn't believe him. There's so much in that scene. This scene is from Back to the Future 2. Maybe it was a warning from science fiction. <laughs> the trend has been more screens and in more places. What's next? A neural implant? I certainly hope not. In 1961, educator and author L. Ron Hubbard observed the effect of television on society. He saw that people who stare at screens, it would produce, it would produce irrationality in them. Video doesn't stimulate the mind to imagine. Video just gives it to you. There's nothing left to be worked out. TV has been brought up time and again for the crime around the world. Program material is what's being blamed. That's not the right target. What's happening is video is pinning us motionless. Get someone to be motionless and to take it easy, and they can get sick. Their life goes wrong, their ability to communicate decreases. They miss chores, their morale shrinks. Some proof of this is the holidays we all recently survived. <laughs> For many, the traditions become to sit around, eat, watch TV. By doing this, our bodies are pinned motionless. We get irrationality, we get sickness. I hope you didn't have a holiday like that. But it's interesting phenomena to observe. You'll even see it on long flights. Passengers are pinned motionless. They can go a little nuts. Now, what does years of traditional sedentary school do to our students when it's in our nature to move? We have to apply this policy to we have to apply these, this principle to our policy in the home and school. Are kids allowed to coddle their device into the night, examining all things the net has to offer? I hope not, and I suggest adopting firm policy against it. We all know what junk food does to our body. What does junk screen time do to our minds? Even adults are losing their own battles with screen addiction. Uh, with screen addiction. Whether it's minutes or hours, Goliath is devouring our lives with a hellish appetite. Men have lost their families, and David may lose his parents. People flick on a screen because of boredom. But boredom is just a warning sign that life isn't being created. My intention is to help you solve this problem. David needs an expert corner man. Here's a few ideas for, for limiting screen time and changing policy. Set up your own screen-free zones and times. Meals should be about talking, checking in with each other, and sharing. There's an idea. <laughs> One simple challenge to you is a monthly candlelit screen-free evening where the entire family agrees to unplug. It may seem weird or unusual in our modern world, but it's never been more necessary to develop screen-free habits. Another simple tool is walking. Have you ever noticed how well you felt after a good screen-free walk? Whether it's a walk around the block or a Camino across Spain, walking to get you extroverted and seeing the space beyond screens is simple and effective. It can be a challenge to take a walk at the end of the day, but the screen is a trap. It leads to more exhaustion and more introversion. As, as tough as this battle may seem, David can win. Courage and knowledge is what beat Goliath. My advice is to know what you're up against. Know Goliath, but don't fear him. Step up to him with your God-given ability and free will. Click off the screen, and down goes Goliath. As David's corner man, you can empower him with the space beyond screens. Thank you, and Godspeed.